And the session is moderated by Paul McWay. McWay. <laughs> you got it right. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I, I have this feeling like we should. Oh, it, can you hear me? Right. Okay. Um, that if we all had our microphones together, we could be a band and maybe sing something to you. You, you can. You can hear me? No, I can hear me. Uh, is that is that is that better now? Is it because it's noisy at the door? Close those doors, please. Keep it noisy. No. Okay. Um, right. So this event is called Each Other's Stories. It's um, about short stories, and um, we're going to talk about um, how short stories travel and um, and um, what stories each of us have to tell, what makes us individual. And um, we have uh, three authors with us today. Um, I've been trying to say Ul Ulrike. Is that close? That's not just it, but close, and that's, that's nice close. enough. <laughs> it's my Northern Irish accent, so we will blame, we'll blame that. Also, because no one can say my name, Paul McVeigh. So uh, we'll try that. Um, so um, Ulrike has published two books of short stories. She's going to read a little bit from one of those um, for us later. Uh, four poetry collections, three albums of poetry in pop music, which I would love to hear. So we will be a band, okay? We will be a band. Maybe during your short story I could play some percussion. No, okay. Uh, she has won many prizes and uh, collaborates with filmmakers and musicians as the Mumbai-based band Aleph. Aleph? Yes. yes. Yeah. And um, she'll be reading from uh, Against Disappearance, which is the title story of your new... You have a new short story collection well, coming up? Well, it's my latest short story collection in German. I do write in German. Uh, it's not yet out in English translation. My English translation uh, right now out is a book of poetry. It's entitled Thick of It. It's also in the bookstore, but this one is not yet in the bookstore, but next year. Okay. Um, next up, we have uh, Meghna Pant, and she's a multi-award winning author, journalist, and speaker. Uh, she's been uh, she has various honours and shortlists for distinguished contribution to literature, including um, Ireland's Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, uh, the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, and the Muse India Young Writer Award, amongst many, as well as the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award. So, pretty impressive. Um, uh, she has two short story collections out, and um, as well as her short stories being published in international journals. And um, she is also brought out, which I think is, will be quite interesting to the writers in the room, um, a book on how to get published. Is that right? New book out. And her new book out, which is not a short story collection, but you know, hopefully there'll be some clues on how to write great short stories and get them published. Yes, there because is. getting them published I'll is be pretty reading the advice. hard. <laughs> Okay. It's very tough to publish short story collections, but I have some advice here that I'd like to share with everyone. Brilliant. A little, a little yes, bit later. can you share them with me? Because, <laughs> you know, I, I'd be delighted. And, uh, and finally, we have Sanjeev Sanyo. Um, now, um, uh, the, the bio I was reading of, of this man means, makes him uh, very scary. Um, as an economist and uh, a, a, a thinker uh, um, outside of the creative field in, in, um, in non-fiction, uh, but also works for the government, so be very careful what you say, I don't know. Um, um, he is the principal economic advisor to the government of India and serves as a co-chair of the G20 Framework Working Group. Um, prior to that, he worked in the financial sector. He was also um, named Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum in 2010. He's an urban theorist and a well-known environmentalist and had won the Eisenhower Fellowship for his work on urban dynamics. So quite the panel here for you today, but he's going to be talking about his short story collection today. Uh, can you give them a little uh, round of applause? Yeah, you deserved it, you deserve it. Um, okay, so the first thing um, I, I'd like to do today is just to ask you all to talk about, um, just as a brief introduction, um, t to the audience about um, uh, your your relationship to short stories, you know how how you fell in love with them, and uh, and maybe a little bit about how how you go about writing them and where they can uh, read your uh, work. Well, uh, I'm I love writing short forms uh, in all in all ways and senses. I do I I'm mainly known as a poet probably, but I've wrote I've been writing short stories since I've been writing poetry, and the thing is, 
as when you write it, it's nice because you get something finished very early and get this nice feeling of, oh yeah, there is a new thing out. It's like when, uh, comparing to when you write on a novel and you know, oh yes, um, I have two, one, 200 pages, my first half is done by now it will, it, and it will take another three years or so. So, and I, I do like, I do like these short runs, and I, but I also like the, um, what I like about short story, that it's not only about storytelling, that it's about language and how language shapes the, what you actually say. So it's kind of an intense language work, same to poetry for me, I'd say. Do you want to give us a little example of your work? I can do, yeah. Your work? My father always thought that my stories were sad, even when I thought I'd written comedies. He rang me up once while I was in a changing room in a shop in Leipzig station to try on a few things for summer. When I read your stories, my father said, I always feel so depressed, it's almost unbearable. But that's terrible, I shouted, and the shop assistant on the other side of the curtain called back, no, it can't be that bad, you're still young. What's that got to do with anything, I shouted at her. I propped the telephone between my shoulder and my, ch and my chin and took off a dark blue petticoat dress that didn't suit me at all. Someone your age can wear anything, the shop assistant explained from outside. And my father said, I'll tell you what it's got to do with it. The people in your stories always die. In your last book alone, there were nine deaths, including six cases of death from natural causes, and the other three died in traffic accidents. That's true, you're right, I said. And the shop assistant, Yes, see, I'm old enough to have a 20-year-old son, and I can tell you I don't go with petticoat dresses, petticoat, uh, dresses in a changing room. And even if you let your characters live, said my father, they are always leaving each other for no good reason. I have a daughter, I said to the sales assistant, and passed her a pile of clothes, keeping the petticoat dress. I know that, my father said, and also that he too has a daughter and is constantly asking himself where she got this negative view of the world from. And knowing that I would not be able to give him an answer, I heard him exhale his pipe smoke, which curled around the handset, and then he put his phone down. My father was wearing a flowery hospital gown with baggy sleeves that revealed his hairy arms lying limp on the bed cover. There were all sorts of pipes and cables sticking out of his skin and which were connected to a machine humming away to itself next to his bed. I put my flowers, a bunch of Achille and poppies, in a glass of water and pulled up a chair. And because I didn't know what I was supposed to do, and because I couldn't think of anything to say, I put my arm around my father's shoulder and pressed my face into his neck. I think the last time I did that was when I was about 10 years old. It was quite an uncomfortable position, and I noticed that the oxygen pipe had come out of his nose, but it didn't move, so I stayed where I was. We stayed like that for a while. Then my father said that it was actually a miracle that God had given him a few extra years, just like that. Extra time, said my father. You can use that in one of your books. And I nodded. Your stories are too short anyway. Far too short, my father continued. It simply won't do. I wanted to contradict him, but then I would have had to have freed myself from his raw embrace in which we found ourselves, and the oxygen pipe was moving further and further away from my father's nose. Not wanting to do anything that would make that worse, I just nodded. And now, my father continued, it would be nice if I could just leave him alone for a little while because it was lunchtime and there was roast chicken with potatoes and parsley sauce on the menu. 
You wouldn't believe how friendly the nurses are here in intensive care, my father said. They seem to anticipate my every need. And he was right there, too. So I took my face from his neck, smoothed down my petticoat dress, and said goodbye. At the door, I ran into the ward sister, who told me that I would have to remove the flowers because they were strictly forbidden on this ward. So I took my dripping bunch of flowers from the vase, waved to my father, who nodded back to me, and disappeared. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Magna, do you like to tell us a little bit about your experience with the short story, why, why you love it so much and how much you've written? So I'd like to ask everybody, how many of you aspire to be short story writers? Anybody in the audience? How many of you aspire to be novelists? And how many of you aspire to write nonfiction? Okay, stick to nonfiction, it sells more. So publishing wisdom will tell you that do not write short stories because they don't sell. Uh, so when I started writing short stories around 10 years ago, uh, everyone told me you're just wasting your time. But I kept at it because for me, I consider myself quintessentially the short story writer. And I kept at it, I kept perfecting my craft. And suddenly, after being rejected, I started getting published in uh, literary magazines across the world. Random House then picked up my short story collection, which is called Happy Birthday. Uh, and that went on to be long listed for the Frank O'Connor Award, which is the world's biggest short, which was actually the world's biggest short story award. Uh, it got shortlisted for the Sahitya Academy Award. Um, and then my next short story collection book, The Trouble with Women, was also picked up. And authors that I grew up, uh, you know, worshipping, like Chitra Banerjee, Diva Karuni, Ashwin Sanghi, Jeet Thail, Namita Gokhale, all of them gave beautiful blurbs for all my short stories. And huge, a lot of critical claim, acclaim also came my way. After that, I won the Fawn Short Story Award um, uh, for my story called People of the Sun. Um, I had uh, got long listed for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize recently for my story Cows That Glow, that the New Yorker, by the way, said they really enjoyed. And by the way, I've been sending my short stories to the New Yorker for the last 10 years and getting back these standard rejection slips. And this was the first time they said we enjoyed this raunchy satire of uh, Indian norms. So my, um, my advice to everybody is that even if people tell you that something doesn't work or something doesn't sell or something will not get published, you must write the story that comes to you. Forget the form, forget the medium, forget the length, because a good story is a good story, no matter what its length is. So aspire to write the best story, not you know, the best-selling story. So that's my advice to short story writers, because dreams do come true, and I'm seeing that uh, with me a lot. Dreams do come true. Do you hear that? All right, nightmares too sometimes, so beware. Um, would you like to read a little bit for us? Sure, sure, of course. So this is the story I was talking about. It's uh, slightly cheeky, it's satirical. I hope I don't get arrested. Um, it's about cows in India. It's very funny, very funny. Very controversial. Please don't arrest me. I know you work for the government. <laughs> no, I'm just being funny. So this was long listed for the, for the Commonwealth uh, Prize. And this is the one that New the New Yorker was also praising. Arif Sheikh looked up from the garbage heap and saw a glowing cow. He rubbed his eyes in disbelief, but there was no mistaking it. A white cow with a bell around her neck was in front of him, and she was glowing. Something had to be wrong. Unexalted animals like dogs, cats, and pigs showed up at the garbage dump, not cows. Something was definitely wrong. Now, Arif Sheikh was a simple man. He did not want to get involved in a mess. He looked at the cow and asked, where have you come from? Are you lost? Can I help you? The cow turned her head and pretended that she couldn't hear him. She must be a Brahmin cow, Arif decided, belonging to a high caste man in the village. This was even worse than he had imagined. In a state of panic, Arif looked carefully at the cow. He saw that the cow was chewing some sort of blue object that had lit up. That's why she was glowing. Ah. Now, Arif was no expert on cow behavior. But this morning, a cow had wandered into his garbage dump, the one that he came to every day, and started chewing something that glowed. And Arif knew, this much he knew, despite having never gone to school, that cows did not chew things that glowed. Cows chewed grass. In this village, at least, 
they chewed nothing but the fresh green grass that grew near the village pond. So wouldn't the cow used to the freshest, greenest pond grass choke on that glowing object? And as an Indian, wasn't he forbidden from letting a cow choke? If something happened, wouldn't he, the garbage collector, be blamed for killing her? Wouldn't the villagers tie him to a bullock cart and stone him? Wouldn't the cow vigilantes from the nearest village lynch him right there in the garbage dump? He had to do something. But what could he do? He couldn't run. If a cow's dead body were found in the garbage dump, everyone would blame him for it. He couldn't pull the glowing object out of the cow's mouth. As a Dalit, an untouchable, he was forbidden from touching a cow, especially a Brahmin cow. But he had to do something. What could he do? Arif spread his hands, turned his face heavenward and said, Oh Allah, show me the way. Grass. If he gave grass to the cow, she'd open her mouth and the damn object would surely fall out. Quickly, Arif plucked some yellow grass growing near the garbage dump. Stooping low in obeisance, he threw the grass in the cow's direction. The cow looked at it for a moment and then turned her head dismissively. Eesh, now what? Wiping the sweat from his forehead, Arif realized he was left with only one option. He'd have to pull the object out from the cow's mouth, but without touching the cow. Could he? He had to. But no one could catch him doing this or it would be the end for him. So he looked around. No one else seemed to be there. Good. He'd have to be quick. Arif wiped his hands against the cleanest part of his soiled dhoti. Garbage collector or not, he wouldn't go near a cow, the nation's mother, with unclean hands. Then he went down on all fours and crawled towards the cow. But the cow? She refused to be startled. She continued to look away, ignoring him. She was definitely a Brahmin cow. Arif stopped when he reached below the cow's head. He extended his hands towards the cow's mouth. His fingers trembled, his hands were instantly covered in the cow's saliva. He ignored the trickle that ran down his arms and gently pulled out the object. Soft like wet peel, long like a sickle, thick like a sugarcane stalk. What strange object was this? He heard voices behind him. Oh no! Look at that Dalit, what is he doing? He's touching our cow, he's hitting her with a rubber toy. He's trying to slit her throat, he's trying to steal her. He's planning to eat her, he is going to kill her. Arif fell to the ground and shouted, I didn't do anything, please don't kill me. The villagers stopped. The village head stepped forward. Arif Sheikh, do you know who this cow is? No, Arif told the chief. Her name is Kalima, she is our temple cow. She's holier than the holiest cow, someone shouted. People from other villages come to worship her, someone else shouted. She escaped during her bath this morning. We've been looking all over the village for her, someone else said. Arif did not know what to do in such hallowed company of men and a cow. He prostrated before them and said, I didn't know, please forgive me. Arif Sheikh, the chief said. Were, hit, were you hitting our cow? No, Arif told the village head. Were you going to slaughter our Kalima? No. Were you going to steal her? No. Were you going to skin her carcass and sell it to your friends? Never, Arif said. Lies, he was violating our cow, we should kick him, someone shouted. The villagers looked at each other. None of them would touch an untouchable. I beg you, Arif pleaded. Think of Gandhiji. He said that non-violence is our way of life. Really? What were you doing with Akalima then? Chief asked. Arif held up the glowing object. I pulled this out of her holiness so that she wouldn't choke. Lies, someone shouted. Quiet, the chief said. Arif saw him look carefully at the object he was holding up. Something about it made his face soften. Are you saying that you saved Akalima? The chief asked him. Arif, who had never taken credit for anything he'd ever done, said, Um, I think so. Did you touch our cow while you tried to save her? I swear, I didn't touch her. Lies, someone shouted. The chief held up his hand. Everyone went silent. I will ask the cow to tell us the truth, he said with a sober face. And there 
Yeah, and what ha what the glowing object is is uh, it gets even more controversial. It's so I have not read the story. Very interesting. So you must buy it and read it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, Sandy, could you tell us a little bit about your background with the short story? What, what do you love about the form and um, how, how you came to writing it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not primarily a short fiction writer, for that matter. I'm a non-fiction writer. Uh, I published several books before I actually published a book of short stories, but as Meghna pointed out, uh, it is fiendishly difficult to publish short stories. Um, and in fact, uh, although I published many books which became bestsellers in the non-fiction genre, uh, I actually started writing my short stories well before that, maybe 15 years before that. In, in fact, the reason I ended up <coughs> uh, writing books at all was because I actually originally wanted to publish the short stories. So when I took it to various publishers, somebody said, oh, well, uh, we don't want to publish your short stories, but since you're a reasonably well-known um, economist, why don't you write a book of, on economics, economic history, which is what my first book was. So I actually ended up publishing a whole bunch of stuff, and I went on a completely different journey because I wanted to publish that original set of short stories which I started writing 15 years ago, and I ultimately published those set of short stories last year. <laughs> so eventually I did it. But why did I want to do publish short stories, and particularly my genre is satire? And the reason for that is I actually um, enjoy reading short stories. And for some reason, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, publishers simply don't like publishing them. And I'm not sure why, because many people read them. And some of the best writers in history were short story writers. I mean, whether you take Tonal Doyle or Tagore, um, worldwide Dahl um, and uh, Jeffrey Archer and uh, clearly they don't have difficulty selling their books so I'm not sure why this mythology exists nevertheless it does exist so I took me some time to get around to publishing it and I also wanted to write satire uh, because I think in some ways satire is a good way to record one's time because in order to be satirical you need to be uh, hyper real about your time so you have to you have to overstate your time in order to make, the, make it satirical or humorous. So that is the reason I wanted to do this. Um, both these traditions of writing satire and writing short stories have somewhat gone into decline uh, worldwide, but particularly in India in recent decades. And I thought that this would be my little contribution to getting it going, which is why I'm here. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the collection of short stories has done very well, so clearly they sell. So I proved my point, um, but the, the fun thing about writing these short stories, and I intersperse them incidentally with poetry as well, random uh, bits of verse, um, and, and the idea is uh, in some ways, if you go back and look at least in Indian history and look at um, how shor short story writers in a sense recorded their times. So in a, if you want to think about early 20th century Eastern India, Bengal in particular, you want to read Tagore, or you want to read 1930s or 40s, you know, um, Gangetic Plains, you want to read Premchand, or the period around about partition, you read Manto, or the 1970s, you read Anita Desai. So in a sense, the short story is a very good place to record your times. The reason you have to do, it, I, I say this more than a novel, because in a novel you see, you have space to create your own world. In a short story, I'm stuck with having to accept, uh, having to use what you as readers already know. I don't have space to create that world. So in a sense, I have to be far more true to the world because I cannot, it's very difficult for, the, for this reason to write uh, science fiction in short form because you cannot create a completely new world. But it, so short stories, in a sense, even if you are uh, um, writing satire, particularly, in fact, if you're writing satire, you have to be, in a sense, recording your times very, very closely. Um, and I, you know, since I, I'm not going to read uh, from any of my books, um, I'll actually give you a sense of the kinds of stories I write about instead. So how many of you are here from Mumbai? Let's see. Uh, quite a few. So I'm sure some of you are aware of um, housing societies, many of you probably live in housing societies. Now, so one of my short stories in, in my recent collection, it's called, by the way, Life Over Two Beers. 
And so Life Over Two Beers, the, one of the stories is about the intense politics that happens inside a housing society. Those who have lived in a housing society anywhere in India will know that the politics of a housing society is far more bitter than in parliament. And so this story is about the complex pol uh, politics between a Mrs. Deshpande, who is the head of the culture subcommittee of the, of the, of the housing uh, society, and Mr. Bajaj, who is the maintenance subcommittee head uh, of that housing society. And of course, they have continuous tiffs over all kinds of things, including, you know, neighborhood boys playing cricket in the garage or whatever it is. And so this is the kind of thing that I kind of write about. So similarly, for example, I, I, when I'm talking about Kolkata, a city of my birth, um, I write about the aging left-wing uh, intellectuals of College Street uh, sitting in the cafe in, uh, 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 in the coffee house, uh, still debating whether or not Maradona did or did not do the hand of God. Um, and they're still debating black and white uh, movies from the 1970s. So that is another kind of thing. Um, then of course I now live in Delhi and I've talked about <coughs> Delhi in many ways. Um, I've talked about the little frauds of the uh, NGO, the big bindi NGO aunties of India Habitat Center. So those of you from Delhi will very much know what I'm describing. And then of course the Khan market consensus. This is basically about um, non-resident Indians who, who fly back uh, to India over the winter and they very often come, uh, they are many of them working in think tanks or uh, universities in, in, in the US or Europe and what they do is they'll come here between uh, the, the middle of December and stay on for three weeks. Some of them will maybe come here and attend JLF and then fly back. And during these three, four weeks that they're here, they will incessantly sit in Khan market and lecture everybody on how to improve India. <laughs> I'm sure all of you have cousins uh, or maybe some of you are those. Uh, <laughs> And so I write about the, this, this sort of phenomena that modern India you face. Um, and so the idea is through these short stories to express some of the India and record it in a sense for our times. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, this, this event is uh, called Each Other's Stories. And when I was thinking about that, I was thinking there's a kind of um, inference there that when we write, we are telling our story, you know? And I was wondering, how much of you is in your work? Um, not as much as, as it looks like, probably, but I like to play with, the, um, with this I in the novel. I like to play with the difference between a narrator and the author. So, for instance, in the story, I, uh, this, this excerpt from the story um, that I was just reading from, um, is basically um, an excerpt uh, about a father of a narrator, uh, a narrator's father, and this excerpt has nothing much to do with the story itself. It's like it's like uh, the story is about like uh, a couple and uh, and a stepson and and their new patriarch family struggles and. Um, and suddenly, as if it had to do with it, which is, of course, on a, on a deeper basis it has, suddenly the narrator ga goes his own way and starts talking about her father. So, and of course, it has to do with my father, but it's not. And of, because I'm the author and not the narrator, and this kind of play around who are you addressing to, who is the who, and, uh, and what does language do with the reader and with myself when I say I in, mm. in a story. That appeals very much to me, and this is like a, like a, philosoph like a game around philosophy, I guess. Because when, I mean, my experience is when you use the I and use the first person, people will always assume the story is about you. Have you, have you had that experience where people think, oh, but it must be you? Yeah, all, I, it's, yeah. it's always the same thing. It's even, it's even more like that in poetry because think, when, yeah. when it gets emotionally, th people think, oh, the author must have been very sad when she wrote this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but it's also a possibility to get close to people because 
because language, of course, evolves images and and uh, and and emotions. So, but it's not necessarily the emit the emotions that I myself feel, but I can kind of use them as a transport means for whatever I want. I am trying to find out. So, for me, poetry rather than uh, for me, prose, short prose, rather than um, telling, uh, like what you said, like uh, capturing the time I'm living in, is more like a sort of re research. It's like a research um, on subjects that doesn't necessary, don't necessarily have to do with the decade I'm actually living in, but with... Um, Yes, with the question about identity, for instance, or f like female identity, or it has to, we are, it has to do with questions that could, I could also research in philosophy, but I chose to do it in prose. Mm. Yeah. And what about yourself? Do you find so, that? Uh, in my short story collection called The Trouble with Women, uh, I wrote a lot about female sexual agency, of women exercising their you know, rights to, to explore different sexual situations, which included a threesome and uh, an ambitious young lady uh, you know, engaging with her boss in inappropriate ways. Uh, this was before the Me Too movement, and that story was actually based on somebody I'd met, a socialite in Delhi, who was then called out during the Me Too movement, and the story was inspired by what he had told me about a young lady. But my mother got so scared scandalized when she read that, that collection. She said, you've written porn, and I'm not going to recommend this book to anybody, to any of my friends. Now, that was the first time my own mother had said that about my own book. Because they can't distinguish uh, the voice of imagination between the voice of the person they know. But for me personally, I don't write about myself or my own stories. I, I, I'm like a magpie, a scavenger. Uh, I'm always looking for other people's experience to f experiences to feed off and to distill into my stories. Um, so, I, I, and I also feel like I can't navel gaze. I know they tell you, especially with your first book, it's you know semi autobiographical. But I feel like my own life is so dull. Like people tell me it's not, but I find it personally like I, I don't think it's that exciting. So I'm like, what's there really to write about? Um, so I, I don't do it. But I, in my next novel, actually, interestingly enough, this is the first time I'll be writing about uh, my experiences. I was in a in an abusive uh, relationship for five years, and um, I'm writing a book about about that uh, with a slightly satirical, again, uh, uh, voice uh, overarching it. But I think that's the first time I'll write about myself, but nothing else that I've created has ever been uh, inspired by me. Sanjeev, do you, um, are you trying to tell your story or how much of you is in your work? Well, uh, I don't think any of the characters in my short stories are me. But of course, it's informed by my experience. And as I mentioned, um, since I'm deliberately trying to satirize my own times, uh, modern India. Obviously, it is informed by the fact that I've lived in the cities I write about, uh, the places I hang around. So if, when I'm talking about Khan Market and sitting in a place called uh, Tortoise Cafe, not too many people have difficulty knowing where that place is. Or if I'm <coughs> describing um, a certain setting in Kolkata, no, people will know exactly because I have actually been there and I'm, I have imbibed the place. So in that sense, um, I think and this is true even of my nonfiction, incidentally. When I'm writing about history, people can generally sense that I've been to those places or been in that situation. So one of the scenes, for example, uh, in uh, one of, uh, in fact, in the very first uh, uh, story of my collection, um, it's, uh, uh, it describes a literature festival. And uh, it describes, uh, I won't tell you exactly which literature festival, maybe it's this one, um, but it, it has scenes which would be very, familiar and anybody who's been to any literature festival. For example, uh, you know, a retired civil servant who stands up pretty much at the end of every uh, such panel and uh, then gives a short speech disguised as a question. Um, and they will start very often by saying, I remember when I was a district magistrate in 1932 and then continue from that point. Um, that kind of thing is obviously something I have seen over and over again. And hopefully the reason that this satire works is because people actually see that. Um, and so many of the things that I, uh, so while I, I wouldn't say any of the characters is me, um, 
certainly I am there because my personal experiences of many things is very much there. Yeah. Um, I once heard a, a writer say, um, and I repeated it yesterday actually when I was talking, um, about short stories that a short story requires a novel's worth of thinking. You kind of need to know exactly what this person is like, how they would speak, how they interact in any, any situation. Would you agree with that? Well, uh, writing a short story is, is I, for me, is a way to finding out. It's for me, it's a, it's an exploration. a way to, yes, it's like I would not, I would be bored easily by uh, myself writing a story uh, about, uh, about uh, and, and already knowing everything from the, from the very beginning. Sure. So, but what I do know is, uh, is a certain aspect of its personality, of the, of the main character's personality, say, which has to do with the story. Meaning, I don't need to know if my personage has a grandmother in Poland, but I do need to know that he lives in Leipzig and has um, a refugee background from the eastern part. So, so there are certain points that have to do with the story that I, of course, need to know very, very clearly, getting back really to to, to, an, to an intense kind of research, but on point. Mm. So I don't, but I don't, I've like, for me, writing in short prose means also getting rid of all the things that you need, would need to research on when you would write a novel. <laughs> And what about you, Megan? So, you know, I've, uh, I've written uh, a novel and two short story collections, and people often ask me this question that what's really the difference? And I always have come up with this answer that a short story is like a fling, and a novel is like a marriage. And I'll explain why. So, of course, you know, uh, they have a lot of elements in common, a short story and a novel, which is uh, the conception, the planning, the execution has to be there. The story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, you, have to, you have to use your imagination as a storyteller. Uh, your reader has to be interested in the story from the start to the, to the finish. Uh, your characters have to be realistic. But I think that's when it really ends because the short story is the canvas that you're working with. It's like a miniature, it's so small. So you have to bring a great deal of economy to what you're writing about. Uh, you have to get cut to the bone very quickly. You have to get to the point very quickly. Uh, you don't have that time to build the sort of longitudinal cathexis with your reader that you could in a novel. Um, so I think that's where the real difference really comes in. You have to be very precise, you have to be taught, you have to be economical. Um, and, and I very often, I feel like short stories are very rewarding because it's an explosion of truth, right? Uh, versus a novel where there's a slow realization of, of many, many truths. Uh, uh, a short story is about one thing, one, one character, one theme, one plot, one narrative motive, versus a novel that can be about several things on, def uh, on different levels. So I think that's where the, the, main story, uh, the main difference lies, that a short story is something exciting. It's, you know, it's something you reminisce about once it's over, so it's like a fling, whereas a novel is like a marriage where, where uh, there are moments where things flag, it's, it's exhausting at times, but it leaves you very exhilarated when you're done with it. I must admit, I have not theorized about my short story writing so much. Um, writing is uh, not my normal profession, unlike maybe for the rest of you. And writing fiction is even subset of my writing career. Um, so I have to say, I write because what the hell, I'm sitting, getting bored out of my mind in a airport lounge. I'm thinking what to do plot comes to my mind or I see a scene or something comes to me and I just begin writing those out and I'll describe how I wrote my very sh first short story um, back in maybe 2003 or something like that. Um, <clears throat> it was basically, I was living in Singapore at that time, it was, a, it was Sunday afternoon, very hot and humid outside um, and I was listening to this band called Ira. Uh, you may have heard of it, very, and I, I like my music really loud. I'm the sort of person where I have teenage kids who complain about the, 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 how loud my music is. <laughs> um, so I put on my music really loud. Uh, I don't care what the neighbors have to say. I was sitting there and randomly began to type out a short story. Not because I planned to write. In fact, at that point, I had never written any, anything other than economics papers and reports. 
Um, and so that's how I have gone about it. I have totally never thought about it. But there are some things certainly about the language and plot that I have applied my mind to. I personally dislike any floral language. I really dislike it. Uh, whether in fiction or my non-fiction, you, those of you who read it, will know I go very direct language, um, only as much as is absolutely necessary to describe the situation. So I, the economy is something that you mentioned and I, I like to do that even when I'm writing a longer piece of work. And so that is basically what I'm focusing on, simplicity of the language, making sure the reader understands that. And I actually invest more in the plot than in the language. Uh, because I don't think verbally, I think visually. So I am just translating whatever I'm seeing like a movie in my head into words, and I try to do it in as few words as I can. I was, I was thinking of when you, you'd said earlier on that your stories had sat um, on your computer, I guess, for 15 years, yes. and then you got the, the opportunity, and I'm quite often when I associate satire, um, I, I, I think of satire, I associate um, sort of very up-to-date um, sort of lampooning of, 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 of what you're seeing around you. So I was wondering, did you need to go back and update those stories then? Because yes, they would have been I, well, uh, let me put it this way. Only four of my original collection actually got published. So I published yeah. stuff along the way and updated them. The technology changed, of course. Uh, if you read my show, it's full of uh, uh, so social media and stuff like that, Google Maps and things, which obviously didn't exist meaningfully in 2004 when I started but totally do today. Uh, so I, I would say that, uh, yes, updating, and of course the stories themselves, the collection itself changed. Um, um, so when I go back and look at my original collection, um, maybe it's come more different from what I set out to do. Have you ever um, read one of your stories like at a, at a festival a year later and, and you start reading it and you go, oh my God, um, I, w I, I would, would not write this story now or that sounds such a clunky line. Do you ever have that experience? I had that with poetry, actually. Mm. I never had that with prose, but, uh, but what, I f what I often had with prose is that I read out one of my very old stories, and I think, oh, that's a strange story. Who wrote this? I could not write this, actually, because there are certain times or decades when you write certain stories, and, and my stories have grown longer and more complex and more theoretical, and, and, the, very, and the stories that I wrote in the very beginning were like very sharp and short and, and like really miniature, as you said. As you said. And, and I couldn't write that anymore, but I do still like it, but it needs some liking it, of course, needs some sort of flexibility now in your own reading, of course, because I look at it as if it was me having written it. I'm, I'm going to ask just before we move, we're just, we're going to move into the audience now for some questions, so get yourselves ready, all right, in a wee minute, come in a wee minute, in a wee minute. I want to ask you one quick thing first, sure, sure. just to sort of spark you off as well, is, um, yeah. you know, what would you, because you've just written this book about getting published in yeah. India, and, um, and, 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 and you write your stories, what's your number one piece of advice for the, the, for the budding short story writers out there? Your number one, yeah. the kind of, the, the, the killer one, what is it? Um, trust your own voice. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise and you know that question you just asked her when we look back sometimes at our photographs from 20 years ago you know we're wearing bangs and big glasses and it was those funny lacy frocks and you're like what was I thinking and I went through that phase as a writer where I'd look back at my work and I'd be like what was I thinking why did I write this but I've realized that self-love for a, for a creator for an artist is extremely it, it's required to be very strong because the whole world uh, you know, we are very critical of ourselves, especially I think as women, we are very, very critical of everything that we do. We need to stop being hard on ourselves. As creators, as artists, our soul is exposed to the world. So let's be kind to ourselves. We always talk about kindness to others. Let's be kind to ourselves. So enjoy what you write, relish it, like savor it. You created something out of nothing. It didn't exist before you created it. So give yourself a pat on the back and enjoy the process. Yeah, or a little cuddle. That's what, they are. That's what I do. All right. Um, who would like to uh, ask us a question? Oh, we well, might as well. Yes, at the front there, and then we'll. 
थैंक यू नमस्ते मेरा नाम निधीश गोयल है आई थिंक आप हिंदी चलेगी समझ में तो आएगी या डेफिनेटली फॉर यू टू मेरा सवाल गाय से रिलेटेड ही है आपसे भी और संजीव सर आपसे भी मैम नेशंस मदर आपने कहा द गाय को अलॉन्ग विद सटायर बट हमने बचपन से अपने एसेज में पढ़ा है कि गाय हमारी माता है हमने कभी नहीं पढ़ा कि गाय राष्ट्र माता है और कामधेनु जिसे कहते हैं और कामधेनु नाम की कोई नस्ल होती ही नहीं है इज द कंप्लीट एनिमल प्लानिट में जो द बेस्ट सिंबल के तौर पे कामधेनु को कहा गया सो वाई इट इज सो द गाय हमारी माता है दस द्यूमन बींग दैट वस दैव कु एवरी वन ऑफ द वर्ल्ड सो गाय हमारी माता है गाय राष्ट्र माता ओनली फॉर द इंडिया नहीं हो सकती और सर uh, क्या पिछले तीन चार साल में जो ये जो चीज़ें आई हैं कि गाय को uh, गाय के लिए किसी को मार दिया गया आ, मारने वाला भी एक पर्टिकुलर कम्युनिटी से है मरने वाला भी पर्टिकुलर कम्युनिटी से है क्या ये भी खान मार्केट से नरेट किया जाता है चाहे घटना कहीं भी हो रही हो बहुत अफी हो यू हैव वेरी ग्रेट इमेजिनेशन इज लाइक कनेक्टिंग द खान मार्केट टू द काव पर आई थिंक द काव विजिलांट इज यू नो वी ऑल हर्ड अबाउट इट एंड आई थिंक इट्स वेरी ड्रैकोनियन दैट Uh, human lives have become uh, so cheap compared to the life of a cow. I'm not disrespecting the cow, but I'm just saying that the kind of there are a lot of lynchings that are going on in India. We've been hearing about uh, over the theories about cows, and that's where the story came from. Uh, but I believe that human life is also very important, and while you know uh, we give respect to everything that is alive, so let's not distinguish. So this it's supposed to be a satirical piece. Uh, and i think i don't know connecting with the khan market i don't know where that comes in but maybe you can answer that to main kisi aur lekhak ki kalpana pe tippadi nahi karna chahta hu ki unki unki kalpana hai unki kahani hai to wahi wahi samjhe ki kya kehna chahte hain to main is pe tippadi nahi karna chahta hu ha shayad isme koi rajnitik ya ideological slant ho sakta hai lekin wo lekhak aur padhne wale ka jo sambandh hai us उस पर निर्भर करता है मैं इस पर इसीलिए मैं मैं अपने तरफ से कोई इस पर टिप्पणी नहीं करूंगा better can you hear me okay so uh, i ne- i wanted to know uh, like ma'am said that you need to be proud of yourself listen to your voice but where do, do i uh, understand where do i draw the line uh, in believing in myself and accepting criticism or accepting constructive criticism to make myself better constructive criticism how do, how do you find receiving criticism how do you I deal feel, with it i feel um If I, uh, do I get your question right that uh, even though you need to respect your own, own voice how to how to become better and how to okay so um, to me it's like there are two like two main steps in writing a story one is uh, trusting in my voice really and and trying to follow my own idea and trying to forget everything that i learned about short stories or literature in general trying to forget everything and just write down what you want to write and the second thing is be your own edit your own story like revise it be your own reader and when you when you try to not be the author but look at your story as if you were the editor or the reader then you you can you can conquer some distance and this kind of distance i find very productive and healthy and from this from this uh, broader angle or broader perspective it is it is it gets easier to pursue your voice but but uh, but shape it in in a way that you wouldn't have you couldn't have done while writing it because you were too close perhaps i have a somewhat different view on this um i like feedback and i read many of my, incidentally my wife is not here she's probably run away but uh, because she is made to listen to the first draft of every piece of writing i do Uh, except my official work all my uh, published writings i i make her listen to them um so i take her feedback for the short stories i made my uh, 
um, 18 year old son listen uh, read some of them to give me feedback because they were written for a younger -ish audience than my usual audience so I got feedback from that and of course I get great feedback from my editors I think Richa is here somewhere in there um, no, she's not here. Oh, there she is. Uh, that's so an editor. Everyone look. Grab her quick on the way yeah. out. <laughs> she gave me a lot of great feedback on, um, uh, on my uh, writings. So um, I think the issue is to be confident of yourself uh, while taking feedback. To, uh, so I actually like feedback. I have sometimes changed, sometimes not changed. Of course, one needs to be still true to one's voice. Uh, but I think feedback is important. Uh, and in fact, you, your own ideas begin to evolve, uh, evolve as a result of it. Now, having said that, it may be the case that my background in nonfiction informs this in some way, because nonfiction is a place where uh, feedback works even better because it's not only imagination. You have to deal with facts. Factual, You're yeah. making an argument. Maybe yeah. the argument is not quite clear and so on. So it may be that somewhere my worldview is driven by my own circumstances. But I at least uh, value feedback. As I think um, writing creatively, uh, creatively can be a, an extremely personal uh, experience. Yeah. And when you, when you give your work for someone else to see, you feel really exposed. And, yeah, and it can really funny. hurt. It's not the same as having an argument or discussion about your political thoughts or, you know, but it's actually exposing something really deep within you and makes you yeah. feel very vulnerable. I think for me, like I've always said, opinions are like armpits. Everybody has them. So you must take, like you know, Sanjeev said, take the constructive criticism, uh, and especially as a female author, if you will get published, uh, remember even Arundhati Roy, when her, the reviews for her books came out, uh, the reviewers were talking more about her looks and what she was wearing and what the, what the color of her lipstick was, instead of the fact that she's actually a pretty damn good writer and a male author will never face this. So just be, be thick-skinned, but like he said, be open to constructive criticism because like even for someone like me, I'm in this for the long haul. So I'm very happy if somebody tells me constructively how I can improve my art as well as the craft of writing. And one thing I must tell you, you asked me what's your piece of advice to short story writers. One place writers really go wrong is the submission process to publishers, especially because publishers have become very finicky about publishing short stories. So there's just one small paragraph, if you'll allow me to read from my, from my book about short stories. So if you're planning to write it, uh, if you're writing a short story collection, it will contain anywhere between 10 to 30 stories, each between around 2,000 to 8,000 words. Check the websites of the publishers, which are listed in the prior chapter, to see which among them is publishing short stories, because all of them don't, and it varies year by year. Uh, in your submission package to a publisher or to an agent, you will need a query letter, a book synopsis, which highlights the theme and four to five of your most hard-hitting stories, three sample stories, um, and also your bio. So just whenever you're submitting, you know, a lot of people tell me that 90 to 95 percent of aspiring writers get rejected and uh, by publishers, by traditional publishers, and their books end up in the slush pile. As a short story writer, your book will more likely than not end up in the slush pile. So make sure that at least you're you get doing right by the process. Don't shortchange your work. Don't shortchange your dream. Get the process right, and you will fly. Yeah, and uh, that's great advice. And also, just um, one, one thing I started doing, you know, when I was moving from an emerging writer to a published one was I would finish a short story and I would put it away. I'd start the next one, and when I'd finish the next one, I would go back to the first one, and I would read it again, like, and it was like a fresh, like, a fresh story, and I would see all these things wrong with it, and that, and, like, that, little, t that little bit of distance can really help. Um, uh, um, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, I, we'll go this side of you minutes. I've yeah. I, I, I had two over there. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Um, as you all mentioned at, you know, at different times that um, your stories reflect your point of view in some sense. Uh, were you starting out, when you were starting out, did you feel fearful that your uh, you know, point of view will have a backlash? And if so, how did you deal with it? You've had a bit of experience with that just now, didn't you? No, is fear right? is the death of the creator. Never fear. No, I don't think at all. I mean, uh, my short stories are perhaps not that off kilter, but Certainly, my nonfiction is very often very different from mainstream uh, views. I mean, my views of history are very different from what is taught in textbooks. Um, and I've had sessions after this is on that. I did a session yesterday on it. So clearly, I'm not a person who gets thrown off by the fact that I'm getting criticized. If anything, uh, picking a fight is uh, something I thoroughly enjoy. <laughs> what about 
do you, do you get nervous about that? I'm not sure that? I understood the question. It was uh, like, um, do you worry that if you write something that there might be a kickback, some oh, sort yeah, of negative okay. reaction to what you're doing? Well, I never, I never worried, but I'm actually working this year, this year on a manuscript to a novel, which has to lo a lot to do with, uh, with um, misuse and violence in, in Germany. And, and the first person narrator has a biography that is close to mine, but it's not me. So uh, what I did is I've, I called up my dad and mom and telling them, well, they are, they, I took some of your uh, life features for this story, but it's not you. I want you to, do, to know that, but that it's not you. And they were kind of relieved, but what I did not say, that it's partly a very lot about them yeah. <laughs> and about the way they deal with violence when it's not yet violence, like the way they talk to each other, the way like violence is dealt with even though there is no violence in the room, like how you deal with the existence of, how you deal with the knowledge when your neighbor's kid is misused and you know about it. So, and, and I'm, um, I'm, I'm really afraid about this book to publish, to be published, um, but I think I should just actually go for it and when it's out I need an extra talk to my, with my parents, neighbors, aunts, uncles, move away, friends and move basically very far away from your parents. <laughs> no way Change to do your phone that. Number, things. <laughs> No, you wouldn't do that. No, I wouldn't, no, but, uh, but uh, talking with people that you wrote about it helps. What was that? Go on, point red, to it, point to the guy, there's a guy that Magna has. Yeah, you, yeah, okay. Very persistent. Yeah, I've been, and uh, though I have an observation and I'm not a district magistrate, uh, but just quick in a, so the regional language in India has been one of the key th reasons why short stories have grown in the regional parts. So I'm from Assam and I know how much, how important short stories are there. So how much Coming for the Brahmaputra Literary Festival, so oh, well, I hope I, I see you yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a lovely place to have a literary festival actually. But my question is that how much of the language or a regional language is important in the growth of short stories because even in Germany, I believe the German short story fiction, a short story is very big and I am aware of it a bit. So how much, what is, what are your point of views on that because we have, we know everybody is reading in English but there is a regional audience and there's a huge growth out there. Yeah, Sanjeev? Yeah, um, I have actually quite strong views on the matter because this is an area where <clears throat> I think Indian language writing has been captured unfortunately by the Sahitya Academy types. Now, <clears throat> there is a great tradition of short story writing as you correctly mentioned across India, particularly Indian languages, of course Tagore, Manto, um, Prem Chand, all of these great writers in Indian languages were short story writers. They also wrote novels and other things, but short story writers, were very, short story writing was very important. Sadly, this culture, although it sort of still exists, has been captured by a certain literary style, which unfortunately, I am sorry, is some simply unreadable now. It has got this certain uh, literary style, as I said, Sahitya Academy literary style, which in my view is stifling these, these, uh, these uh, languages. I think it's very important now to get new writing in, into new exciting writing and different about different things. I mean, where is uh, detective novels and short stories or uh, science fiction and other things in Indian languages? There used to be in Bengali, for example, a great tradition of writing detective novels with uh, people like Satyajit Ray uh, wrote uh, detective novels and short stories. Um, who is today's Satyajit Ray? Who is today's Tagore? Who is today's Manto? I, in fact, ask people from Indian language, uh, well-known writers who are now very well-known, many awards, etc., some of which they return also, about who is the great writer of today who is now 40 years old and likely to become tomorrow, uh, become a great uh, Tagore. And I'm simply never given a good name. So I think it is very important for Indian languages to s get on with writing new literature, unfortunately is being captured by the same dead narrative. I'm sorry, I mean, Premchand's Eid Guy is a great story, but I can't read it anymore. 
Okay, um, unfortunately on that note, we, we're finished. And I mean, I'm sure the authors will be around wanting to sign their books. Um, lots of books for you to buy. And also you can come in and talk to them and we say thank you very much to our panel. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. We, will we wish to thank Sanjeev Sanyal, Meghna Pan, Ulrike Sandik, Paul Mack. Thank you so much all. The authors would be signing in the author signing area next to Darbar Hall.